behalf of the Republic of Zambia, I think it's my pleasure to Africa Brains, the government of the Western Cape, Professor O'Connor of the Western Cape University, for having brought the leadership in Africa to come and chart our destiny on a number of subjects I think that we've so far been discussing. Before I go into my presentation on ICT for education in Zambia, I just want to say a few things which may not be on the presentation slides. Zambia is a country with a population of 13 million people as of the 2010 uh, census. Zambia has 8,500 primary schools against a patri 650 secondary schools. Zambia has three public universities and 17 private universities. Now, in our quest to ensure that the key thematic areas in education, access, quality, relevance, and equity, if you look at our primary subsector, where I said we've got 8,500 and primary schools, of course, there was significant investment at the primary subsector. I want to give you this, this brief history so that you understand even before I start talking about ICT for education. We've got 8,500 primary schools. Of those, about 2,000 of them have got inappropriate infrastructure. The infrastructure is about what I would refer to as inappropriate. If you look at the 8,500 primary schools, we expanded because of the same issues of the EFA goals, the Millennium Development goals, with a view that we can have significant numbers of people accessing our education system. But against that background, if you look at the thematic area of quality, of course, in the end, there was a compromise because you want to have significant numbers in terms of enrollment. You want also to ensure that there is equity between the girl child and the boy child. But in the end, of course, there are also some compromise in terms of quality. Our education system in Zambia runs from grade one to grade nine. And then you've got grade 10 to grade 12. And then you've got the, the tertiary education system. We've got again, I think on the tertiary subsector, we've got about 28 TEVET institutions. So that tells you the history where we are coming from, where I said at secondary subsector you've got 650 secondary schools, but you've got 8,500 primary schools, which means that there is a natural dropout, because if you have got 650 secondary schools and 8,500 primary schools, definitely there will be a natural dropout. So given those policy dilemmas, and then the fact that we also need to embrace ICT in our education system, so it is not easy for we ourselves sitting in the Ministry of Education having to direct policy because you are talking of 8,500 primary schools. Some of them, especially for our kids who are in grade 8 and grade 9, some of these primary schools where they are going, they don't have the labs and, and, and so forth. So you can see the significant amount of challenges that we have even before I talk about the ICT for education. Colleagues and fellow participants, having said that, let me now dedicate a few minutes that I have to look at ICT in education. Just like many of the presenters have said here today, ICT for me should be looked at as an inclusive tool. For us in the education sector, probably we'll be looking at ICT from the education sector point of view. But I think for me it's a cross-cutting tool that needs to be looked at from an interministerial point of view if it has to bring any relevance in terms of our social and economic development in our countries. Having said that, <clears throat> if you look at the second decade of education for Africa, which is 2006 to 2015 draft plan of action, the AU recognized that education is a critical sector whose performance directly affects and determines the quality and the scale of Africa's development agenda. It also notes that education forms the basis for developing science, 
technology and innovation which are catalysts for enhancing resources, industrialization, and for participation in the global knowledge economy. Fellow participants, information and communication technology is a critical tool in preparing students to acquire the required skills and competences as it makes them continuously adapt to work of constant technological innovation. And for sure, you can tell if you look at the various technology which is on display here, you can see how far we've moved as a continent and as a, and as a world. <clears throat> ICT makes it easier for students to access knowledge and is an engine for growth and a tool for empowerment. ICT is also an enabler for both innovation and education, without which a knowledge society cannot be realized, supported, or further developed. ICT enables learning anywhere, anytime, and anyhow, and the knowledge is not constrained by geographic pro proximity, offering immense possibilities for sharing, archiving, and retrieval of knowledge. And this is exactly what is happening. If you look at, I think, some of the things that I'm going to mention because of ICT being an enabler, you are able to network with a university in India, in South Africa, in the UK. And we've got a number of partnerships with many of our schools partnering with schools in, in, in Europe. Therefore, ICT widens access to education. However, the growth of ICT networks alone, just like many presenters have said, will not build a knowledge society. Thus, ICT should be a facilitator for major education and development reforms. National ICT infrastructure projects in Zambia. If you look at the area presenters here, I think there is a recognition that the connectivity aspect is quite expensive. So how are we moving as a nation in Zambia? In Zambia, many of our companies, both Prestato and the private sector, are investing in the laying of optic fiber. For example, we have got the Copper Belt Energy Company, which is a private company. We've got Zambia Electric Supply Co uh, Corporation, ZESCO, which is a Prestato. And we've got Zamtel, the telecom company, which is also a Prestato. These have been instrumental in the laying of the fiber optic network, and I think it is um, a, a, a envisage that once this is completed, these projects are completed, I'm sure the issue of data transmission, the issue of bandwidth and the cost are likely to go down. We've got also internet service providers that have invested in wireless connectivity and increased both the speed and internet bandwidth. ZICTA, which is the Zambia Information and the Communication Technology Authority, which is the regulator, and also mobile service providers are also putting up towers. If you look at Zambia as a country, the biggest population are found in the rural areas. And we have had the challenge as a country where most of these uh, mobile you know, operators, you know, they are interested in profit making, and some of these rural areas are not worth from a commercial point of view. So ZICTA, which is a, a regulator and a statutory body, are working with these mobile uh, operators to ensure that our rural areas are also not disadvantaged. Then the Zambia Information and Communication Technology Authority, which is a regulator, is also or has laid a fiber optic for the Zambia Research and Education Network to ensure that our universities and the colleges and research institutions are connected and are on a networking approach. ZICTA also, as a country, recognizing the nature of our rural areas where if you are not careful in the investment for these ICT projects, you are going to create a social divide between the poor and the rich. And in recognition of that, the government decided, I think working with ZICTA, which is a statutory body, to ensure that we have got telecenters in the rural areas. This project has started, and we are sure going forward is going to narrow the digital divide between the rural and the urban areas. <clears throat> what are some of the initiatives that we have taken? Those were the projects at a national level. Now I want to look at some of the initiatives in the education sector in our country and how ICT is trying to help us to reinvigorate or reform you know, classroom management. 
In Zambia, ICT is being used for teaching and learning in schools and colleges, and the Minister has embarked on the Connecting Institution of Learning project that will network 150 schools and all colleges of education. This project is being done in a phased approach, you know, because of the cost implication. Then we have got electronic and mobile learning being used in colleges with mobile phones used to send assignments and other teaching and learning materials. And at one time, we had a school where there was, I think, some riot or demonstration. And when my minister went there, and the genesis was the school administration were telling the pupils not to use mobile phones. Somehow, we don't know what happened. But when my minister went there, you know, because if you look at a phone, it's, it's not only a tool that we should use for communication or talking to. It is a tool that you can also use for learning. And my minister, when he went to that school, he went and gave the, 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 the school administration a challenge to say, no, we are in the digital world. This phone that you are seeing these people carrying, it is not only for talking on or seeing, no. It is also a tool that can be used to improve their learning. So you can see. The ministry is also using a mobile laboratory e-learning bus, and this bus was bought, you know, after some conferences in 2007 and 2010, which were held in Zambia, and we are using it more in our rural areas to sensitize the communities, the pupils, and the teachers on e-learning and on ICT. So it has also supported the Ministry of Education in terms of capacity building for our teachers and the pupils, even before the, 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 the learning project where we want to connect this school reaches some of these rural areas. We have also developed portals where teaching and learning materials are uploaded, IG, EG. We've got the iSchool projects and the eGranary project. <clears throat> Using ICT networks, the ministry has expanded also its sphere of operations beyond national borders by partnering with the schools in the other countries. And I think I alluded to that. We've got, I think, some partnership with, uh, with the Republic of Ireland, with the United Kingdom, where we have got exchange programs where our students, our teachers, they go to these countries and like that. And beyond that also, we've got, because of this digital connect, they are able to network using ICT infrastructure. We've got also the ministry's website that can be accessed from anywhere, and people can get some of the services they want electronically. Furthermore, the ministry has trained teachers to develop e-content in open education resource, who are now developing the content for schools. The ministry has, assigned, has signed an agreement with Microsoft that has culminated into getting software for the schools at concessional prices. For example, you know, we've got these bigger projects in which we want really to connect all the schools using this ICT infrastructure, but then I think in the Africa continent, the, the costs are very prohibitive. Then we are very grateful to Microsoft. They came on board and said, no, we are willing, they were willing to provide the government of the Republic of Zambia with concessional rates, and that agreement was signed, I think, two months ago. Furthermore, the Ministry and Microsoft Partnership has also facilitated the establishment of Microsoft centers at 50 schools where training and examinations in ICT will be conducted. And I just want to say something, I think, to our cooperating partners who are here, of course, who are providing the leadership in terms of ICT infrastructure. What is key in Africa is for us, in terms of the Ministry of Education, or even other sectors in our, in our various countries, to work with you in a more symbiotic process. You know, for example, the way Microsoft came on board and said, no, look, we are willing to give you these concession rates. So for me, I think that's a path that we should take if this country surely will us to benefit from the ICT infrastructure. But if we don't go through the symbiotic process or in, in terms of our working relationship, it would be difficult for the ICT infrastructure to be relevant in Africa. Using also a blended interactive radio instruction methodology by radio to conduct lessons combined with face-to-face -face in Zambia also, it has really helped us. We've, got also, we've, got, we've also introduced a postgraduate diploma in ICT policy and regulation. Furthermore, also one of our units within the Ministry of Education, which is called Education Broadcasting Services, has developed a video best learning, mate, uh, best learning materials in science and mathematics to 
set the shortage of teachers in these subjects. So that project, uh, uh, of course, also is going to help us a lot as a country, given that we have got significant shortage of mathematics and science teachers, because most of these guys, when you train them, they would prefer to go and work for the private sector, because probably there the condition of service are better than we are able to offer in the government. More choice also has provided DSTV instructional TV bouquets to selected schools and colleges where learners and teachers could download education materials at their own time. The two universities uh, in our country, UNS and CBU, are also connected to facilitate sharing of teaching and learning sessions. Tele-education is also further being conducted at Mulungushu University under the Africa Virtual University Project connecting it to universities in India. So the Mulungushu University and the Indian universities are able to network and share because of that platform. What are some of also the implementation challenges that we have? Listening attentively from the previous speakers, you could see that there is some convergence in terms of the challenges that we have as a continent in terms of implementing the ICT infrastructure. And these are some of them. They may not be specific to Zambia, but I'm sure they are also, you know, applicable to other African countries. Developing countries, Africa inclusive, generally face challenges in terms of capacity, human and financial resources to announce the potential of ICT successfully and effectively. Because if you haven't invested in your optic fiber, if you haven't invested in your human resource capacity building, and if you don't have significant budget, because there are very few African countries that have got significant budget in terms of ICT infrastructure, uh, you know, investment. So obviously this is a challenge that we face as a continent and Zambia is not an exception to that. We've also heard and I, 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 I listened attentively when John said we should be able to put pressure on those, I think on the private sector to ensure that the connectivity, hardware and software costs, which are currently prohibitive, are looked at. So we need as governments with our various, uh, you know, private partners to come together that if we have to realize as a continent the significance of ICT infrastructure, the costs have to come down. Otherwise, like I said earlier on, ICT in Africa will be irrelevant. Furthermore, you may wish to recognize fellow participants that we have a weak legal framework to curb cybercrime coupled with inadequate legal champions in ICT. I don't think we have moved as nations in terms of reforming the legislative agenda as far as ICT is concerned. And we've got that challenge to do with cybercrime and other crimes related to ICT. Access to ICT facilities is also limited with very low capacity skills for the teachers to handle the technology. When I listened, if I'm not mistaken, with uh, the Deputy Minister for Economic Development for South Africa, where she was talking about teachers providing the leadership, because you can take ICTs to, to as many schools as possible, but if there is no leadership and managerial skill at the school level, then your ICT will not provide the value that you'd be looking at as a nation. Therefore, we recognize in Zambia, and I'm sure this might be applicable to other nations, that we need to invest in staff development as far as ICT is concerned. In Zambia, for example, We've got currently schools that have got computer laboratories, but we have not gone further to reform our curriculum in terms of this ICT. So you find a teacher who just does ICT at his own, then is made to start teaching ICT, which is not correct. And this is why I think the government is committed on that agenda to ensure that the curriculum is reformed and the ICT becomes part of that. Furthermore, Colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, due to inadequate investment in ICT coupled with inadequate collaboration, it is tending to bring out social disparities between rich and the poor. It has created a digital divide. And this is what I said. And this is why ZICTA, which is our regulatory authority in Zambia, is trying to open up telecenters in the rural areas where there is free internet, you know, their, 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 their photocopying equipment, so that our rural population also we don't divide this marginalization between the, the rural and the urban areas. But it is a difficult challenge also in, in, in that regard. Education further, 
education change further has not transformed the school systems into learning organization as the system is still stuck to old and conventional teaching methods in most schools where a teacher would prefer to use a chalk and you know a, a blackboard because if he's confr confronted with this new technology well there is that resentment because they have been used to old teaching methods which we as leaders and as managers who are privileged to be in the decision making positions we need with commitment and vigor to ensure that that old mentality of wanting to stick to the chalk and the board is dealt with and reformed. Colleagues also uh, <clears throat> our other point is on, in terms of power deficit if you look at the continent as a war Zambia is not an exception we've got significant even physical infrastructure when I was in Mauritius, I think three weeks ago, those that attended the Commonwealth, when we had an 18th system uh, ministers on education, the Commonwealth was proposing the rationalization of the education department as far as it relates to the African countries or the Commonwealth uh, countries. And one of the significant de debate and argument was based on the, on, on the fact that, oh yes, we recognize as Africans that we can go the ICT platform way in terms of the way the Commonwealth relates to ourselves. But given the significant physical infrastructure challenges that we have, for example, I was talking about 8,500 primary schools dotted around Zambia, some of them without electricity, some of them the infrastructure poor, how would you even then bring in ICT? That was uh, the argument that we were giving them to say, as much as they would want to rationalize or restructure the way the education department at the Commonwealth works, but we need to recognize these challenges that we have as a continent or as Commonwealth countries. And power deficit is one of them, especially many of our rural areas, even in Zambia, most of these schools, they don't have power. So how would you bring ICT to these schools? Mobile service providers also have done very little to utilize their networks for teaching and learning, despite that, of course, they have got a significant coverage around the country in Zambia, but their network has not provided a greater impetus in terms of improving our teaching and learning. Colleagues and fellow participants, there is very little investment in e-content development as there are very few people developers of such materials. But I'm sure with the technology moving on, I think this will be the thing of the past. I can see many of the displays here that I think we are moving on as a continent. Colleagues, fellow delegates, digitalization of teaching and learning materials has also brought challenges of intellectual property and copyright. I'm sure you are aware about that. And I think we need as, as, as a continent and as a people to move forward and see how we can work around that. Technology integration has also brought challenges of standards and interoperability based issues related to support. Introduction of new technologies has also created a backlash from those expected to change how they work. And this is what I was just saying earlier on, where you expect a teacher who has been used to using a chalk and, and a blackboard to be given the new technology, to be given an iPad, probably there would be that resistance. But I'm sure as, as, as a continent and as a people, we can also work around that. On the way forward and on the conclusion, we are saying as a country, Governments need to invest in ICT integration and to avoid the project approach to enhance sustainability. If you look at Zambia as a case example, we've got so much donor support in terms of providing computers to our schools. But there is no approach in the way we are going to integrate this. You find this school has been given this sort of hardware, software, which is becoming significantly difficult. So we need in terms of our education ICT policy reform to ensure that there is integration. As much as we appreciate this donor support and partnership and collaboration, but that cannot come at the expense of the integration and the sustainability of our ICT infrastructure. Second, as part of the way forward, is to integrate ICT into the education curriculum at all levels. To this effect, government has reformed the curriculum and created a technical and academic pathway. I was delighted when my colleagues from Botswana and, and, and Zimbabwe were talking about vocationalization. For me, that's the way forward for our continent. As much as we would want to train engineers, 
as much as you want to train, name it, the engine for social and economic development is an artisan. And if you look at the images which were displayed, I think, by the moderator in the other previous session, it is critical if you looked at those activities which were being shown that we as a continent, we need to invest in the vocational aspect of our tertiary education institutions. And this is why in Zambia, the government is trying to reform our curriculum with a view that we move away from one academic pathway where you just want to produce white or blue collar, uh, you know, uh, you know, students. We are also investing now into the technical path which is going to chart the future for Zambia going forward, given that, you know, we are a mining country and as such, we need to invest so much into our technical education aspect. And I look forward to collaborating my colleague from Zim. If you are going to have that conference, please uh, send an invitation to Zambia since we are also reviewing our curriculum. <laughs> Furthermore, uh, fellow participants, we need to have a national backbone to make connectivity cheaper. And this is why I'm saying three key companies in Zambia are investing in the optic fiber because the government is of the view that once those projects are completed, I think the connectivity aspect is going to be a little bit cheaper. Going forward further also, as Zambia, we need to invest in human resource, train the teachers to handle ICT as they are key in integrating ICT into the sectors. And on the basis of that, the government in the Republic of Zambia is transforming certain colleges, which used to be colleges, into universities. Because we used to have a problem where, you know, teachers could just go into any university. But because we want to ensure that we create this professionalization in the teaching profession, we are opening up three universities probably into next year that are going to cater for our teaching staff. And we believe ICT is going to be part of the greater agenda when those universities are opened into next year. <clears throat> Colleagues and fellow participants, Africa further is endowed as you are aware with a lot of water and sunshine. There is therefore need to investigate the you know, further possibilities into other alternative sources of energy. Because as you are aware, of course, hydro generation is also quite expensive. But if we investigate it further, I think we are able to, to get around that. In our country, because of the power deficit, you know, always load shedding, the government of the Republic of Zambia, as part of also ensuring that the ICT is not looked at from an isolation, it is an interministerial approach which we are taking. Various institutions are coming on board. ZESCO is busy. In addition to laying the fiber optic uh, network, they are also investing in power generation and distribution. And we've got maybe closer to 25 projects that are currently concurrently running in Zambia. And I'm sure in the next few years, Zambia is going to become a net exporter of power to other Sadic countries. Furthermore, we need to strengthen ICT policies, implementation and legal frameworks and identify champions to spearhead, to spearhead them. If you look at this yellow booklet that I have, this is one of called Action Taken Report. This is one of uh, a report on education and science and technology from a parliamentary session committee. And one of the issues that they raise is exactly what is put here, where we need to ensure that we have got ICT policies. And in addition to that, you need to have champions. Because what we tend to have in our various countries or in our various ministries is where you find maybe the champion is sitting somewhere. But the ministry which is, which is supposed to spearhead the implementation of ICT is also somewhere. We need to ensure that there is policy cohesion. Uh, 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 we need to ensure that we harness our policies so that We've got these policies in terms of ICT, and the champions are properly identified. And I'm sure for us as a Minister of Education in Zambia, that is going to be one of our key projects in the new year, because we've got the ICT draft policy, which is, uh, which is yet to be approved by Cabinet. But what we need going into next year is to ensure that we have got a clear roadmap in terms of what do we want to achieve in terms of ICT. Because bringing ICT is one thing, the value addition is also another one. So we want as this policy is approved by cabinet maybe into the new year, we also have got a clear roadmap so that even when we, we, we invite you as partners in terms of these the manufacturers and the providers of these uh, ICT equipment, we clear have a roadmap in terms of what to achieve in terms of our output at the end of, of, of the day. 
We need also to build an ICT ex center of excellence to champion ICT, e-learning, and e-government affairs. And in the Republic of Zambia, the Department of Science is, of course, investigating, you know, the investment into a science and technology park. I'm sure maybe between, uh, probably into next year, we are likely to start constructing the science and technology park to harness this. Government, as I said also, I gave you the, the little bit history about our country where I said 8,500 schools, and most of these are in the rural areas. What we have done, like I have also said, colleagues and fellow participants, is ICT should be looked from a package point of view. We are talking about the optic fiber. We are talking about investing in the power generation. We are also now talking about opening up roads in the rural areas. The, 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 the president of the Republic of Zambia last month just launched the Link Zambia Road Project, which is going to connect the rural areas and it's going to cover about 8,000 kilometers plus. And the government wants to have all the schools which are in the rural areas to be accessible. Because if today I have to talk to MTN or Airtel to say, you guys, why don't you go and put up a mobile tower in the rural areas? First of all, they will even tell you, Minister, look, there is no road. So how are we going to transport our equipment? So this is why as a government, and looking from a package point of view, the government is opening up these 8,000 kilometer roads and it's already started in terms of construction. We are further, like I said in my uh, previous speech, they are establishing ICT incubation centers and technology parks to promote entrepreneurship and development of local ICT companies by the youth graduating from tertiary institutions. Need to transform our education systems to provide the 21st century kind of teaching and learning environment where learners are creators and agents of change. Government also, like I said, is already investing in the upgrading of universities so far, in total, we have got about three of, of course, the universities are likely to open into next year. We've got three additional more where we are going to start the construction also into next year. So we have got about six universities which the government of the Republic of Zambia is investing in. And this is against the background that I told you where we have got only three private universities, 17 private universities. And the quality also is compromised in the way. Government also, as I said, one of the thematic areas of education is equity. In order to ensure that we address this equity, government is constructing in all the provinces, in all the 10 provinces of Zambia that we have girls technical secondary school. And I'm, I'm sure if Microsoft is here, they would even be able to admit that at one time they provided smart boards to some of these. It's, it's fantastic when you go into some of those... Uh, uh, girls taking secondary schools. So we have got a number of them that are undergoing construction and most of these are opening up into next year. So this provides also, like I said, universities being constructed. A number, we've got about 48 secondary schools that are opening into next year. Some of those, I think about 10 or so of those will be girls taking secondary schools. And most of these secondary schools now that are being constructed, because if you look at our pre-post independent secondary schools, they never, most of them never used to have laboratories or what. So most of these new uh, secondary schools that are being constructed, they are coming with laboratories, computer laboratories, and physics, and you know, science, and, and biology laboratories. And what we want is to ensure that as a government, we invest significantly in this ICT infrastructure. And at the end of the day, the girl child should not be left out. Colleagues, in my conclusion, let me say this. We as African leaders, we may be in different positions, but I guess those people that are here are the champions of change. What we saw, the video that we saw at the Western Cape University yesterday, I think it was, it was quite incredible if, if you looked at that video presentation. And I'm sure we should not be let down by the history of the African continent. For me, as a continent and as a people, we need to move forward and provide leadership and be practical. Many a times have these conferences, great ones, exceptional ones, been organized. But the question is, we should be asking ourselves as, as, as a content, as, as a people, is what has been the value of these conferences? We need now to have a, a paradigm shift where issues that are discussed, the respective countries should take practical aspects to ensure that if we have to create competitive advantage in the African continent and in our respective countries, we need to embrace innovation. We need to embrace ICT. 
When we were taken around at the University of the West Cape, what you saw there is where a mixture of subjects is being combined. You look at science, you look at biology, chemistry, you look at ICT being, being combined in terms of the university undertaking research. So this is why ICT, we should not sit as countries and say, no, ICT is going to follow us. No, we need to have a clear roadmap in terms of how we invest into the ICT into our various countries. And we need to provide the leadership that is required to ensure that ICT innovation provides the competitive advantage that our countries require. With those few remarks, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you. And ICT is no longer, you know, you cannot say ICT, we are going to stand alone and, no, no, no. ICT is a strategic option going forward. Doing nothing is a strategic option anymore. Therefore, we need as countries to invest in ICT. I greatly thank you.